Hello. Welcome to this week's episode of Get the Fork Out. We have Yacht Chef, Danny Davies, uh, cookbook author, fellow podcaster, and uh, also war veteran. Like five tours uh, as a chef in the armed forces for the UK. Amazing dude, such good conversations, lots of insight, cheerful attitude, definitely someone that's seen the grittier side of life and uh, really push through and positive attitude. Just a really uh, inspiring podcast. Like I had a great time chatting with a guy and I just re-listened to it now. Uh, hope you enjoy this episode. I'll get the pork out. Get the pork out. Hello everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Get the Fork Out. We have uh, Danny Davies, uh, author, hey, how you doing? yacht chef, podcaster, and uh, we're going to go over some of his uh, cool projects outside of cooking on a yacht, which we all love, but we all have other interests and other passions, don't we, Danny? Welcome. Hi, how you doing? Nice to see you. Yeah, man. Good to yeah, see you. Been a while, Good right? to see you. Absolutely. Yeah, where are you? Um, I'm up in New York at the moment at my uh, boss's house. I'll give you a little shout around. We're up at the Lake House. Very nice. Oh, you yeah. out there. Um, we flew up here on, on Monday uh, and then fly back on Sunday. And I'm going to go to the Palm Beach show and do the podcast, my podcast, Behind the Line with Chef Danny Davis with Triton News. We're going to do that on, on Sunday at the live boat show in Palm Beach. So looking forward Amazing. to that. Amazing. So who, who do you have on uh, on the, the behind the line uh, with uh, with Danny Davies? Who's your who's your next guest? I saw you had Chef Tully. Uh, yeah, we did Jamie Tully. Um, I've, I've recorded six now. Um, the one at the Palm Beach is going to be live. Um, we've done some we've done some good ones. I don't want to say too much, but anyone who follows me on Instagram has already seen like the little teasers come out. We did a good right. one in um, in Fort Lauderdale with uh, Andrew Leacher. We went around all the different places, like how to provision in Fort Lauderdale. That was really good fun. Yeah, wicked. Yeah, wicked. And so you're doing them in a different format. Um, you're doing them in person, which I think is really cool. Like, I can't do that. Um, but I think it's really, yeah, it's, it's epic, man. And I'm really happy that you're doing a podcast. Yeah, I mean, you kind of inspired me. Eh? Um, I remember in <laughs> COVID times in lockdown, watching your videos and just saying, this is great. We kept trying to do it ourselves, but um, with the stewardesses, but we just kept laughing and we couldn't do it. We just had too much fun, I guess. Um, but yeah, they really kept me going and, and you kind of inspired me and get the fork out and what you do with the olive oil and gasoline. I just think it's great that, you know, chefs can do the long hours, put the grind in, but also, you know, get out and do something else and share it to other chefs who are in the galley, putting the hours in, grinding out. And like, yeah. you know, th there comes a point when you've listened to all of your um, playlists and all your music and you just want to have something different. And, and I use your podcast a lot and just listen to it and be prepping away. Um, awesome, really man. interesting. Thanks. And you've had yes, some great I, chefs I, on as well. Some fantastic. I chefs. appreciate that. Yeah, I feel very lucky that I, I know I know interesting people in this industry, and I think I mean the word that drives this whole thing is community. And I just think it's like my time to to put something back into the community, and you know, I make I make nothing on it. I just find it interesting and something I want to do. But I do think like. Yeah, it's it's something for the community. Like I just want us all to kind of be connected a little bit more. But yeah, definitely. Uh, I mean, you, you know what it's like in, in a kitchen in, on land. You know, you, you've got a little team around you, and those people you spend yeah. hours and hours and hours with. And then you get on a boat. Um, I was a sole chef for two years, and it's just you and the occasional crew member that floats past in the galley. And you know, you just you need someone just to kind of bounce ideas off and to talk about talk to things about and work things out in your own head and. Um, and the banter as well. I miss the banter, the camaraderie, <laughs> you know, the, the, the Mickey taking and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, yeah, community is a huge, huge part of it. Um, and we're so isolated. We're like little islands on our boats, aren't we? Floating around. Yeah. We can all see each other out the galley window but, uh, and, and message each other. But, yeah, it's so nice to see video and to hear people talk and, and find out their story and how they became a chef and, and how they got into the audience. It's, it's really good fun. Yeah, I, I want to talk about you. Uh, definitely, but I'm, I'm happy to talk about this a little long because I think it's important. I, I just, I grew up in restaurants and like I, I've been working with food for since I was 16. So just like you said, like I grew up in these environments where there's banter. Like you just, that's what you do. That's how you pass the time. That's how you do the same shit all day, every day. 
it, as passionate as you are, it gets monotonous and you need to talk a lot of shit to get by. So I did 10 years as a soul chef and I've, I've missed that. You're just it's so lonely in terms of that camaraderie. Obviously the crew are great. The crew are amazing. Um, but I just felt like to do this kind of podcast thing was to connect to a community again, to be in a community with chefs, to bounce ideas off of like, I just, yeah, I just, community that's it man that's it yeah it is community networking different people it's just it's it's what drives us isn't it yeah and it well it just makes us better because we can we can lean on each other for ideas inspiration uh any kind of support whether it's uh, physical or technical like it's just man, it's powerful and then you get plugged in and it's like the resources are it's almost limitless i love it yeah I, I really and i do i do feel like I did when I used to work at a best restaurant in Boston. Like I, I have that feeling now, even though it's digital, it's really the best we can do. I feel like. Yeah. And I love what um, Aaron's doing at Culinary Convenience. He started the chef's club. Oh yeah. On Tuesday yeah. Night. I mean, that's fantastic. I've never been able to make it to one, but just hearing the, the banter that comes back from it and the, and the good vibes <laughs> that people have about it. It's just so good. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important uh, just to, to stick together a little bit through these times. I think it's, uh, it's really important. Um, but uh, hi, Chief Engineer. <laughs> yeah, good. You're welcome. You're welcome. Um, Chief Engineer just walked in. Yeah, I, I, think, it's, I think it's amazing. But let, let's hear your story, man. Like, what, where did it all start for you? Do you have like um, a parent that inspired you to cook or a relative or something got you into restaurants or... Let's I, was, so, I, was, I was a bit of a bad boy in school. Ah, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got bullied a lot and I used to like fighting. Um, and uh, I used to have, I have three sisters. Um, and when I was around uh, 12, 13 years old, uh, my mum couldn't leave me alone on a Sunday. She would work at a, a pub as a waitress um, doing Sunday, Sunday roast in Britain. It's a huge thing. Um, so she started dragging me along just so that I wouldn't cause any trouble at home. Uh, and I started washing the pots, um, worked with this really um, beautiful, beautiful, sold old lady. She's probably, like, looking back, she's probably in her 50s. But, you know, back then, you got really old really quick, right? So she's a still old lady. And she'd make Sunday roast for around 50, 60 people. Uh, and I would wash the dishes. Um, and every week, she'd be like, you know, peel the potatoes for me, peel the carrots for me. Um, and after maybe two or three months, I, I kind of had it, you know, I could come in, I could get the carrots smashed out, get all the veg preps, yep. get all the meat tied up, start making the Yorkshire puddings. Um, and just got like, it was, um, I would then carry their food to the table, to their regulars and, and give them their, their roast beef and their Yorkshire puddings and everything. And it just became like, I was important. I had a place, you know, I had a, a like a spot, you know, somewhere I belonged. Uh, and I didn't have that before in life. I was just always a bit, you know, bouncing from one thing to the next. Um, and it just became a part of me. Um, I did that for a couple of years. Uh, I got a girl pregnant in school, which was terrible. But it, it all went well in the end. But my nan sent me off to um, culinary college because my uncle had gone to culinary college. Um, so I went to culinary college, did a couple of years there. I started working in a, like a high-end fish restaurant. Um, I learned so much. Again, it was a, another... Little old lady just knew how to cook by taste <laughs> and feel, and she just she just taught me. Um, I learned so much from her. A little Cornish lady, um, and, and she got more and more sick, and I kind of took over more and more and more. Um, I got my first um, head chef job at eighteen in a, an Italian restaurant, and I mean, looking back now, uh, you know, the guy just needed someone to cook, but I thought I was Gordon Ramsay. I was like, you know, look at me, eighteen head chef. <laughs> Um, which is which is intense. It was an 80 seater um, Italian restaurant. We had a pizzeria yeah. inside the pizza oven inside the restaurant, and we did all of the, the hot food from from the main kitchen. Um, just lost the deal with the ordering, you know, staff. Yes, I mean staff. Just a huge problems, and just dealing with all that. And I kind of moved away from cooking, um, but I always oh. wanted to join the army. So I joined the army as a soldier, um, and you have to have a trade. So of course I went for chef. Um, but because I'd been a head chef and learned the kind of the ways of the kitchen, more than management of the kitchen, I got put into the officer's mess in like every situation that I was in. Um, so I ended up looking after the kind of 1% of the British Army. Um, and that led, oh, me on to some, yeah, that led me on to lots of amazing things. Like I did a ski instructor's course, I did Arctic survival, jungle stuff, urban warfare, uh, five tours of duty. 
um, Iraq, Afghanistan, Kosovo. Uh, and my last year, I was the chef for Prince Harry and Prince William, which was a, it was a great honor. Um, and, and two you know, really cool people to work with. Um, and I, I left the army, moved to Fiji with my wife. We had our first kid, moved to New Zealand, moved back to Fiji, um, and then came to Florida. Um, and started doing some chef consultancy. So working on a, a, a wedding venue and kind of streamlining that and trying to make it more profitable. Then came back to England, went to work in Afghanistan for the American army, set up a, a DFAC, a dining facility. So started doing like really large scale stuff in like industrial feeding stations. Wait, sorry, set up a, a what? Uh, a, a DFAC, a dining facility where um, okay. I think it was, was 6,000 feet up a mountain on the Pakistan border, um, and we were a hawk's nest for an airport. So I, I fed around, we fed around 800 soldiers at a team of 65, um, and, and was like just wow. upscaling the amount of people that I could cook for because I thought that's where the money was. Um, <laughs> it's, not, it's not fun being in Afghanistan up a mountain, um, so I only did it for no. like, uh, around nine months, like 10 months I think I did it for. Um, and then I got a job as a teacher back in the UK and I started teaching uh, culinary arts, um, catering and hospitality, waiting tables, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's when I started the Future Chef Project. I was trying to get um, my students had to write letters as part of their English exam. Um, and they all wanted to write them to Gordon Ramsay and Jane Oliver and those kind of people. But they would never answer or you'd get some PR, you know, slip of paper saying thanks very yeah. much. And that was kind of it. So I created this network on LinkedIn and started linking with chefs that were happy just to receive letters and respond to them. Uh, and it started off really small. I think I've got over 20,000 now on, on LinkedIn and a really big network of people that are very willing to share information with new people coming into the industry. Um, and, and that kind of took me onto different things. I started working with kids that had speech and language issues and they wanted to learn to cook. But there, uh, yeah, it was just difficult. So what I would do is I would yeah. record myself cooking the dishes uh, and they, they would go back to their specialist college um, and they would watch the videos over and over and over again. And then when they came back the next week, we would cook it. And to start off with, it was really ropey. But once we brought the videos in, they, they just got better at it. They just understood it more because they could absorb it, you know? Uh -huh. For me and you, if someone shows you how to do something like your... Um, Lockdown videos, if you show me how to chop an onion, you know, two, three times I've got it, right? And most students right. are like that. But these kids, they just couldn't, it just didn't sink in. So the videos really helped. And that got me interested in like websites, social media. I think I was, it was Twitter back then. I used to do it on Twitter and YouTube, oh. posted on YouTube. Then a London college got hold of me um, and I went and started up uh, London Careers College. Um, kind of upscale what I was doing. So instead of just um, me cooking, I would go to Michelin star rosette restaurants and hotels, spend a week with their chefs, record the dishes, and then we had um, we had students doing the same thing. They'd watch the video three, four times, learn the dish. We wow, usually hook up with them. Uh, yeah, it was really good, hey. Eh? And we'd have yeah. like two or three of the um, chefs would watch the videos of the, of the students cooking, or we'd do a live link up. Uh, and then they would pick two or three of the chefs and they would go off to their restaurant and do two, three weeks stages there. Um, and that was through a two year program that we had them. So the, the kids that came out of that program after two years just had so much knowledge, so much skill. Yeah. And they were trained to the restaurant that wanted to take them for a job. So we were like pipelining them from, from school straight into, you know, mission star or rosé place, yeah. which is great. Everybody wins. Everybody. Yeah, everybody wins. That's, that's great. What a fabulous idea, because it's just such a good way to educate people and get them on the right path where a restaurant doesn't have to take greenies. You know, they are green, yeah. but at least they have some knowledge. We found that we did a couple of focus groups and we found that, you know, um, head chefs would be saying, I don't want a Caitlin college student because they think they know this and they know nothing. So we're like, yeah. well, what do they need to know? You know, what, what, what should we teach them? So we start teaching them their yeah. menus. Yeah, and it works, right? Because if they already know to do it before you've got them, it's, it's, it's a no-brainer. Oh, so I, I went from that, I started doing consultancy, um, working with these bigger restaurants and hotels. A lot of people would ask me, can you do this? Can you do this training session? So I started doing that in kind of the summer holidays, opening restaurants, um, did a few strange concepts. I did a, a cycling cafe. I had a bike shop upstairs, <laughs> uh, a mechanics like on the same level as a restaurant, and it was all refuel, recharge, 
and reward. So everything on the menu was either a refuel thing where it's like protein based or it was um, recharge where it was vitalizing shakes and energy drinks and things like that, or it was reward and it was cakes and, and buns and everything. Um, and then you could have had repair. Had... You could have afforded And repair, yeah, they did. And the yeah. repair was like through into the mechanics, yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> and restock was the, was the bike shop upstairs. It was a clever idea. Um, so we did, we did that. I did a bunch of other ones. Um, I did a, started doing hotels into wedding venues. Again, I was like de- determined that the more people you could feed, the more money you would make. So I kept doing these big operations. Um, me and the missus, we've got two kids together. We decided we wanted to go live in Florida. Um, so tried to do that. Trump got into power. It all kind of got a bit ropey. And someone suggested, why don't you become a yacht chef? And I was like, what's a yacht chef? And I was thinking of it as, you know, like a cruise chef, like someone works in a cruise boat. Cruise ship, and it was kind of like, no, I don't know if I want to do it. Um, an old army friend um, got me in contact with a, a Navy guy who's called John Jones. He's called the um, the Migrating Chef, and he had a YouTube channel, and he was on Instagram. And he said, start an Instagram channel, start putting your food out there, and and you know, do your CV, do your SCTW, do all that kind of stuff, and and you'll be all right. You're a good, you know, you're a good chef. You've got a good head on your shoulders. You'll be okay. So I did it. I, um, I was a bit worried that I wouldn't be able to cook. So I went back to a, a really busy pub. We used to do like 250, 300 people. I took that head chef job for three months and it was That's horrible. Hard. Yeah, That's I was like 14, 15 hours a day. Just oh, As soon as the doors open at 12 o'clock, you just got slammed until 9.30. Just yeah. ticket after ticket after ticket. It was crazy. Um, and But I felt like, you know, I, I got back on the pots and pans and was ready to shake and bake. Um, and yeah, then I got my first job yeah. on a yacht on El Luce Sail, which is a big 125-meter royal yacht. And that was a real eye-opener. I had a head chef and a crew chef, and I was the salad chef. So to come from opening um, restaurants to being, you know, making salads, I was like, what's going on? But the money was really good, and the education was really good. Um, I did, did about three weeks on there, uh, and then I got my first job as a sole chef um, on a charter boat in the Bahamas and I've kind of just kind of stayed in the Bahamas I've done a couple of med seasons um, but that kind of 50 meter yacht range charter boat it's kind of where I've been at yeah yeah I'm very familiar I'm very familiar and, and do you are you do you like that size do you like being soul chef or do you want to do something more a bigger team oriented or I mean it's it's been really fun um on, I was on excellence a 150 um, foot um, charter boat for two years and it's sold now um, but I just went over to Germany um, to Lursen and set up uh, Project Enzo which is now uh, Apu which is again a 100, 115 foot 150 meter huge boat um, oh, yeah. massive team yeah. like 50 crew I think 45 operates with like 55 crew in total we had everybody there as well um, and I took over from the, the other chef the head chef who had rotated out and he got to Jamaica to work at the boss's hotel and I was literally just taking his orders in of all the food, all the equipment the you know the thermomixers the, the small equipment the racking the shelving taking all that in and then ordering all the food dealing with the contractors dealing with negotiations which it's going to cost and all that recruiting staff yeah. training staff uh, two months and I was like I'm done it was such hard work and so yeah. stressful and so cold um, so yeah, I did it for two months. I came back to Florida with the idea that I was going to go back and join them in, in Jamaica. Um, but my uh, my uh, my baby mama and my um, kids kind of gave me the ultimatum of dad will want me to stay at home. Um, I've been working for the family that I'm working for now. I've been working for them for a year. They let me go and do the Jamaican job boat because it's such a big thing, great opportunity. Um, and they took me back. Um, and so I'm, I'm working for them now. Um, we got a, a boat trip a yacht trip up in New England in the summer. Um, they just came back from Galapagos on a boat. So I'm kind of, I'm still doing boats, but um, I'm kind of staying in this family for now. Yeah, fam- I mean, your family first as well. Like kind of, I, I don't have that that pull, so I get it that, yeah, it's it's the most important thing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm like six weeks on a boat, two weeks at home, six weeks on a boat. You know, it's yeah. five years of doing it. They just, it's not enough really. Kids are getting older. My oldest is 13, youngest is 10. And they're like, Dad, you're never home. And it's like, yeah. 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 Kind of got it really, yeah. 
Um, so, so that brings us to kind of like your current spot in the timeline. Like this is now Danny Davies is here. Now I, I would love to talk about your cookbook. What, what happened, what inspired that and, and tell us the kind of the process of, of designing, uh, printing, testing, and like, I'm sure a lot of chefs would love to know that. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it's been a journey. Um, I have a few friends that I got chefs. <laughs> that have written books. So um, a lot of people have said to me, you should write a book, you should write a book. So I started investigating and finding out like what it takes. And I was honestly just put off by the amount of work, amount of time and money that goes into it. Um, and then yeah. someone suggested to me, why don't you self-publish on Amazon? So I started looking at that and going, actually, it's not, it's not that crazy. Um, yeah. The reason I chose Vegan Plus is the family I cook for now, the, the boss is uh, an elite athlete. He does triathlons and stuff like that. And he's a... Um, his food regime is very strict in what he eats and when he eats it and how many calories and all that kind of stuff. And he's kind of cut out um, meat completely from his diet. So it's mainly fish, a little bit of fish, a little bit of cheese, a little bit of egg, like some proteins, but mainly it's plant-based. So I started eating like that too and running and um, just found like I had a, a new lease of life. I had so much energy when I woke up. I, had, um, I would recover quicker from runs. I'd do a run. And then like the next day, my legs would be stiff and stuff like that. But when I started being plant-based, I'd get up, I'd be fine. Like I wouldn't have that soreness or that um, inflammation, or, you know, just like that grogginess in the morning of like, oh, another day, I can't get away to get a coffee. It's just revitalized. So I was like, this is great. This is fantastic. Um, I started getting a lot of traction on, on Instagram with some of the pictures I was taking. Um, so I was like, well, let's match the pictures with some recipes and kind of put my ethos together and put a book together. So I started doing that. Um, it didn't take too long to kind of come together. I had to get some help with the kind of layout and the way it has to be. Um, yeah. And then just open an account on Amazon, a, a Kindle direct publishing it's called, and, and published it. And um, it's available. You can, uh, you can buy it as a, an audio book. I think it's like 15 books as an audio book. You can buy the actual copy, which they print out for like 20 bucks. Um, it's just an ebook. It's just recipes and um, plating notes. And a little bit about the ethos of what I do. Um, I've got another one in the works now. I did one with uh, Chef Manny, who's a Mexican chef. Um, so we've done it. We called it Vegan Plus Mexican. A um, lot of little uh, tricks and a kind of uh, different techniques in there, but uh, sticking mainly to Mexican food and trying not to really replace the meat with vegetables, rather make it plant-based from the beginning. Okay. Well, what's, that's what's Manny's last name? Uh, Vasquez. Okay, I, I, I was thinking about different Manny. Um, so what, yeah, where, where, can, yeah. Where, where can uh, where can people buy your book? Like pitch it. Like tell just just uh, so it's on Amazon. Buy. It's on Amazon. Just yeah. search for Chef Danny Davis. Just search on, on Vegan Plus Danny Davis, and they'll they'll find it. Yeah, they'll find it. It's there. That's all. Awesome. I'll give you some and links. You can put it. You can put it below. It's, it's in the bio yeah, well, below. Right? Yeah, link. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're supposed to say this too. Like, uh, yeah, like and uh, like and subscribe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, um, subscribe, comment, and share. Comments, yeah, all that. Share it. <laughs> Thanks for both of us. Um, so, what is a? Because I, right as you said, uh, audio book. So, what is a? Because I haven't heard an audio cookbook before. Uh, talk, talk us through that. Um, well, it, basically, it's the same thing, right? So, you've got to have quite a bit about your ethos and, and what you're planning to do, um, and then it's it's the recipe. Um, yeah. So listening to it back, you've got to make sure that it kind of makes sense uh, and it's not just a list of instructions. Like we're used to having recipes <laughs> like put this up, put that in there. So just trying to add a little right. bit more kind of um, a voice. Observations. Approach. Yeah, it's going to sound like this and it's going to smell like this and look like this. And then you flip it over that kind of. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> All right. That's That's it. So yeah, I've got like another it. one coming out. We got we got the Mexican one coming out. Um, I've got a couple more in the works. We're kind of working with now. Um, I kind of got it down to a bit of a, an art, so we can get them out pretty quick. But it's getting chefs over to take the pictures of the food, cook the food, and get the pictures of the food. That's my kind of sticking point at the minute. Yeah, that would take a while. That that would take mm -hmm. a while. And I heard and recipe testing as well. But I mean, I don't think that's that hard in terms of like getting the ingredients properly so that people can create recreate it quite accurately but yeah i don't think that's that hard i just have a friend of mine that does it but she's not a professional chef so i think she gets hung up on the on the recipe testing but 
Yeah, it takes a while. Awesome. You have to you have to go through it a few times, definitely. Yeah, and 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 it's good to get someone else to cook it as well, because you know, as a chef, oh. you kind of a little bit of this, yeah. a little bit of that, and yeah. yeah. So I, I actually get my my youngest girl. She does my recipe testing. She's ten, ah. um, but she's the wizard in the kitchen. Um, she we get That's Hello so Fresh. Cool. And she does the Hello Fresh recipes. It's like a card, and you get all the ingredients. So she's she's not bad actually. She can make sushi as well, which I'm I'm, I'm very proud of. That's great, man. That's awesome. I'm sure you taught her well. What, so what, how, take us through recipe testing. How does that work? Because like, like if you do, if you add too much something, you got to like start over again and dial it back and weigh it out. And is there, do you, yeah, basically, you, you just gotta, shit? Um, no, because normally I write the recipe beforehand, right? So I'm like, I know what's right. going in it. So you just weigh everything out and then, and then make it again and, and test it and, take, and see what it tastes like. See if it tastes good. Um, a lot of the dishes that I make have pickles in and things like that. So it's difficult to like recreate it because it takes three weeks for the pickle to taste good. Um, so a lot of that I kind of do. I'll, I'll make a, a batch of pickle and I'll keep using the, the same thing. Um, but yeah, for like um, most of the dishes are pretty simple as well and pretty quick and easy to make. So I mean, like so the, the tuna donut that everyone loves, um, that's just a tuna, ahi tuna um, and avocado with a bit of mango in it. You know, it's like a dish that I think every yacht chef has in their repertoire somewhere, mango and, and tuna <laughs> and, and, so and avocado, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so that's what I did was just decorate it nicely and make it look pretty. Yeah, I saw it on Instagram. That's a great dish. Love it. Yeah. Yeah, I made it an NFT now. Did you? Yeah. Kind oh, of like man, dabbled that's... in that area. I don't really understand it 100%, but I know that it's going to get bigger, right? I mean, if Facebook are going to oh, change yeah. the name to Meta, it's going to get bigger. Yeah, I, I like it as well, too. Like, I, I think it's kind of horrible how... Uh, I'll just name one genre. Like, musical artists don't get paid like they used to. Like, they just don't make the same amount of money, and you can make an argument, do they need to? Whatever. But they're also kind of getting their shit stolen and kind of ripped off with streaming services. And I think NFTs help that sort of thing where it's just locked down and that's kind of as far as my information goes on what they are i kind of get it and it, it just it's just a way to copyright shit forever. yeah basically yeah just to prove that's yours it's like a stamp in time isn't it yeah yeah i haven't i haven't minted any so none are for sale but they're up there the project's up there um i don't know where it's gonna go my uh, again my little girl made me a um a virtual restaurant in um in roblox so you can go visit that. It's called Vegan Plus in um, <laughs> Restaurant Tycoon Two. <laughs> Is it Roblox or like a Minecraft sort of sort of thing? Yeah, so it's like a little a little metaverse, right? Um, okay. It's restaurant Tycoon Two. You can go in. Anyone can go in and they search for Vegan Plus, and you can go to my restaurant and have some vegan food virtually. <laughs> virtually eat. Yeah, that's the next thing. It's somehow going to satiate us somehow. Um, all right. Well, that's. I mean, Vegan Plus sounds awesome. Um, I'm going to buy a company, a copy. I think everyone should like, fuck it. Why not? Let's support Danny's new thing here. And so, so what's, what's now behind the line, the podcast, uh, cause so, so that's, that's your biggest thing. Now you, you cook for a elite athlete and then you have uh, vegan plus you're doing vegan plus Mexican and now behind the line and take us through what that looks like. I think you're doing it, uh, with Triton. Something yeah. Like so, um, okay. Uh, one of the agents I used to use is Corley, Corley Quirk. I don't know if you know her, Corley. She's fantastic. So when I left Excellence, well, nearly a year ago now, um, I had a long conversation with her, um, and they're building a place in the Bahamas called Hurricane Hole where we're doing that. And we talked yeah. a lot about that. Familiar. I used to have this idea about making a um, uh, growing microherbs and flowers in the Bahamas in, a, in containers and then selling it to you to have this fantastic idea I was going to do it but COVID happened and I kind of mm. didn't um, uh, um, she got me in contact with her husband um, who just bought Triton magazine and then he said why don't you speak to the editor let's see what you can do write a few stories so I sat down with a lady called um, Kerry Bailey and I didn't know but she like literally just been hired um, a couple of weeks before as their sales and marketing. So we sat down, we had a chat. And she said, oh, you know, maybe you should do a podcast like Joe Rogan. And I was like, yeah, there's a couple of people that do podcasts. I mentioned your name. I was like, yeah, that'd be really interesting. <laughs> and it's just kind of snowballed from there. We, I mean, we, we, it's just me and her. We have a, a phone and a, and a microphone and, and we get the chefs 
and literally just find a place to sit down and do it. Um, yeah. The last one we did with Patricia Clark, I actually broke into, I didn't break in, I not tell anybody, ah, I snuck in through a window. Yeah, yeah. I snuck yeah. in through a window at um, LMC in their gym and we recorded it in the gym. I mean, that's the kind of level <laughs> of that. Um, Good. But we, we've got it out. We've got the first one out. Um, we've got six in the bag where we've got a bunch of people lined up to record some more. Hopefully we're going to get some sponsorship for it. Um, it's just a great way to, using Triton is a great way to kind of put it out there. Um, oh, their yeah. magazine, I don't know if you remember it from a few years ago, it just kind of used to come out when there was a boat show on it. It'd be like the local newspaper that would go out. Oh, no, no, I'm, I'm very familiar. I, I know um, the old owners, Lucy and Lucy Shab. Oh, and David Reed. Yeah. 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 Nice people. Yeah. yeah. Lovely people, right? Yeah. Um, but very small scale, not on the level of like Boat International or Dot Walk. Um, and that's where they're trying to go. They're trying to, they're trying to move it to more of a glossy magazine and, 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 and distribute it further than just um, Fort Lauderdale and, and um, West Palm Beach. Um, and so I'm, you know, happy to help them with their digital side of it um, to give myself a voice and to give other yacht chefs a voice i think there's yeah. so many times there's such a bad rap as, as yacht chefs that we're some alcoholic drug fueled um right. monsters that just kind of sit in a galley and <laughs> and most of us aren't most of us have done fantastic stuff in our life you know travel yeah. extensively we have a massive yeah. repertoire of food not just like we cook one thing we can do baking sushi barbecue like so many yeah. different things um and i just think it's really interesting and also there's usually only one or two chefs on a boat and there's so many other bits, members of crew. We just, I don't think we get the platform that we deserve as chefs and the, the amount of time and effort it takes just, just to be on the boat, just to be a chef on a boat takes a massive amount of time and effort to get to. We're not, you know, line cooks in, in Arby's or, or Olive Garden. There's, there's a different level to a, to a yacht chef and I just don't think we get the, the right platform. So I'm happy that I've got behind the line to kind of get people out there. Um, and also, you know, a lot of chefs have a little sideline, right? A little hustle on the side, something else they're doing. Always. And it, and it gives them a chance to kind of promote that on, um, on behind the line. We just had Jamie Tully. He's, um, he's got Culinary, Culinary Genius is his store, an online store, and he sells knives and stuff like that. And he's trying to expand yeah. it now to become a provisioner, which I think is a fantastic idea. Um, yeah, we'll, you know, we'll put that link in the comments as well. Yeah, it's in the comments. <laughs> in the comments, right next to the subscribe button. <laughs> Dude, well, I love, like, like this is, I think you just said it quite succinctly, like, right there, a side hustle. Like, you can be a yacht chef and still want to do other things and actually maybe need to do other things. Like, for your sanity, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's great. I, I really appreciate all those. Um, kind of what the different things that you've tried and like uh, achieved and it's not i think it's the way forward um just to be a yacht chef is great i still love it but to still just want and need to do other things it's incredible yeah i mean it is our lives isn't it you know you get up in the morning you're in the galley and you spend all day in the galley you know to have something else to kind of bounce off or to talk about at least you know it, it's just it feels better I'm sick of talking about food to people, you know. Whenever you meet anyone new, it's like, oh, what do you like to cook? Oh, what do you think of this? And it's like, oh, come on, I've been doing this for 25 years. Yeah. You know, let's yeah. talk about something else. Let's talk about what you do. Yeah, yeah I, I agree. That those those questions are um, my favorite is I think we just talked about it on the on the group, which is about like um, oh, what was the question? what's your specialty you know like well that's not what we do it's not it's not even possible in this line of work like you got to be a jack of all trades yeah you're gonna be special at everything yeah. you're really special yeah <laughs> special at everything ah, that's good yeah no nah, it's it's a fun it's a fun career because you like you end up like learning a bunch of shit about these food and these cultures and it's fascinating and then you can travel these places sometimes just innately through work and be completely immersed it's amazing but yeah it's, yeah, it's one of the one of the nicest things is being like so completely immersed in the culture and the food um i've really enjoyed uh, a few years ago i was out in the bvis um and we we had a we had the jamaican guy on from the boat i just did actually from the poop and he really wanted to taste the local food so you know you just gotta like 
what what can you do? You can't get off the boat for a couple of hours and go and you know yeah. see some locals. You've got to research it, work it out, get some local ingredients in, and, and give I it. I think your best immersed shot. might be the wrong word. Like I don't think how you can be immersed in a culture floating around on a super yacht. I think I misspoke <laughs> on that one. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's definitely yeah. A, a, another level of uh, immersion that you can do, right? Yeah. But I know a lot of yeah. chefs that have spent time in, in like Mexico and stuff like that and really got in, got in deep yeah. and, and learned a lot of stuff. Yeah. No, it's possible. It just depends on the uh, on the program. For, well, I mean, I can name the reasons, but I won't now. I just I love charter boats, so it's usually just back to back, and that's, there's no time for that. But hence rotation. Hence a motorcycle trip around the world for the last 15 years off and on. Like, I, I mean, I love a side hustle. I love a good side hustle. <laughs> yeah. Well, I never know where you are. Like every time I see you like in another country doing something else, and I just think that's fantastic. Thanks, man. Yeah. It's, it's good fun. I think it's, uh, I, I for, for went, if that's a word, the, the wife and kids. And so that's the kind of, uh, the freedom I can, uh, I can have at this point in time, but it's, uh, Man, that trip up north was ridiculous. But it's a story for another time. A story for another time. Um, what's 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 next? How many how many vegan plus books do you think you want to do? What's uh, my target's like ten over two years. Um, but I'm just I'm just going at it, you know. Like I, I'm trying not to set myself too many targets. Um, I'm spending a lot more time in the gym now and kind of working on my on me, um, which yeah. is nice to have that kind of time to do it. Um, and, and obviously working for the guy that I do, you know, it's a very important. I stay in, stay in shape and stay trim and don't become his fat chef and he's some elite athlete in triathlon. So <laughs> like, I feel like I need to keep a certain level of, uh, of fitness going. Um, but yeah, I'm just like, just seeing how it goes. Um, knocking them out when I can. It, again, it's getting the chefs in. It's getting someone to be with me for a couple of days just to cook the food. That's, that's a real sticking point, really. And is it like the next one? Is there going to be another like ethnic variety, another spin on it, like vegan plus so Greek re- or Italian? I've recorded one with a Ukrainian chef, um, yeah. but she's just asked me to hold back on it because of what's happening in the world right now. Oh, so we're no. just sit on that one a little bit. Yeah, she's got a lot of she. Of course, she's got family, um, and so she's not mm. available. Let's say, yeah, I think that's the best way to put it. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's that one. Um, and yeah, I'm just looking for the next one, really. Ah, sick. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, the, I, I really, uh, I love that you're doing a podcast. I love that someone else is doing a podcast because I just think it's like, like what you said, it's, it's just interesting stories. There's, there's all kinds of characters in this business and it's just fun to get to talk to them, put it out there. Whoever listens, listens. And I, you know what I want? I'd like to get, I love having chefs and I think chefs are, are easy and fun, but I'd like to get more suppliers on. Yeah, that's something I'm, I'm really interested in because seeing the, their point of view, because that's yeah. who we deal with the most of, right, and, and have the problems with or have the good things with. So yeah. it would be really interesting to see, to find out their story, how they became provisioners and, and how they do things. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm trying. I've been knocking on a few doors, but everyone seems busy or doesn't really want to talk. Yeah, busy or kind of shy. Um, but it's, it's, it's going to happen. But... Provisioners are great. Uh, I think of whoever's not a yacht chef doesn't know that a provisioner during a busy season is it's almost as important as your your sous chef or it, it's such a re- necessary reliant thing with all these guest requests that come last minute and plans change and your provisions are heading east but now we're going west and they need to flip it around like it's it's incredible what they do. So I I want more provisioners on on the uh, on the podcast but also um people that grow things, you know, like people that grow cattle in the UK or I would love to have, cause they're so, I find those stories so fascinating. Like, just tell me, tell me how it's done. Like it's great. Yeah. To see where your, where the raw products come from and how they get to yeah. you and, and the yeah. care and effort that's taken into that. Yeah. It's so true. You had that guy on, I can't remember his name um, from Amsterdam. who does all the um, ferments and pickles and things like that. Oh, um, no, Japanese. Yeah, I think it's, it might be Dennis. Dennis S. Someone like that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Dennis is awesome. Yeah, oh, he's doing really cool stuff. We, we're trying to get him from, from your podcast. I, I got in contact with him, and we got some fantastic stuff from him. And what a what a guy! He's so passionate about what he does. And 
It's yeah. a le- the level of understanding of what he does is phenomenal. I had a great yeah. conversation. Yeah. Yeah, he's a he's a wealth of food knowledge, not just Japanese, but definitely that is his specialty. But yeah, we're, we're trying to get him to make some garams for us, um, but just cost effectively. He, I don't think he really wanted to kind of do it or start it, but he's. Um, I'm going to turn one of these fridges into a um, a uh, fish aging box with poji. And he turned me on to that because I went to Belgium to go visit him. It's like to, ha- to age fish that way and to age meat, like age anything that way. It's intense. It's really cool. So there's a fridge here that we don't really use. Uh, I just want to jerry rig it a little bit. And then I- I'd like to get on the uh, the dry aged fish guy. Have you seen him on uh, on Instagram? No, I haven't, but I have tried a bit. I, I did some halibut um, and I did some tuna. Uh, pretty good results. Yeah, pretty tasty. Because yeah. you've got to get all that moisture out of there first, right? That's what that's exactly. Yeah. yeah, it just makes sense. You just concentrate all the flavors and the fats and just get rid of some of that, that flavorless water. Mm-hmm. Intense flavors, really cool. Really, really good, good. yeah. Halibut was like creamy and yeah, sublime. It was really, really like just different level texture wise. It was like some crazy kind of, um, it was like almost oily. It had the, because that was all that's left. All the moisture had gone. It was just like the oil of the fish and this beautiful silky flavor and texture. Yeah, it's really good. Oh, I love it. It sounds like counterintuitive. It sounds disgusting. Like you're going to eat it. Yeah, it sounds like it would stink as well, right? When I first did it, yeah. I was like, this is But it doesn't at all. <laughs> it doesn't. It's all in, the, all in the cleaning. Like you got to clean the hell out of it and just kind of get any kind of, kind of nasty bacteria off it but i don't know that that association with bacteria is so different like there's so many positive bacteria it's like we're we're covered in bacteria and full of it as it is but not all bacteria is, is created equal so yeah get the bad ones off and just leave room to get covered in the good stuff and you have nothing to worry about mm-hmm. i love it yeah i want to get good at it but then yeah dennis is great he, I, I would like to have him on again because he's just the stuff he could talk about incredible yeah. What's next for you? What are, what are you doing next? Um, let's see. I just because you just took over just, this, right? The yacht guys left. Yeah, yeah. So I'm. I got ten weeks. Ten weeks here in Barcelona. We got a refit coming, which is great. Uh, my sous chef is going on leave because there's going to be a, a good stint where the galley is going to be down. But so not a full galley refit, but just the hotline, minus the ovens. The ovens are still brand new. Yeah, I'm excited. And then we go into like busy charter season, but I'll, then I'll, I'll swing off and then uh, Ruin will come on. And I, not getting too much into it, I've got a, a pretty sick father in California. So I have to, I, I would love to go to the motorcycle. I'm getting it prepped now. It, it kind of got fucked up uh, at the shop I had it at for a while. And, and COVID, I couldn't go to it. So the, um, yeah, I would love to go to the bike, but I'll probably have to go to California and just help my dad out a little bit. But we'll see. Yeah, that'll be in June. Yeah. Yeah, June, eh? it's not that far away, is it really? No. Man, 10 weeks on, 10 weeks off. I love the rotation. It's great. Rotation charter. For me, it's that is perfect. Like I love it. You get yeah. you get charter guests and you have the everything that goes along with that, all the positive challenges, because that's how I look at it. Because you don't know what part of food town they're going to take you. You have no idea. And then you go to that part of food town. And you're like, holy shit, I like it here. This is great. This is or like, as you discovered with your boss, like you kind of get led in a direction by someone's dietary, either restrictions or needs. And it's, you end up learning a bunch of new shit. You know where to learn. Um, yeah, true. So I, when I, I, when I had that- a bunch of the daughter, uh, they, were, they were a nightmare. Like we had just him and, it, and the missus on and, Jesus, everything I put up, they were like, no, we can't eat this. We don't want that. We don't want it like this. It was such a battle. Um, but yeah, every time I actually served them food, they were over the moon with it. And then to make oh, the really? offer, like, yeah, it's been great. Um, how, how about you? How do you do it? Do you have like set menus that you do for each charter? Or yeah. do you just kind of well, go for it? No, I just kind of go for it. Like I, like I just lay out like each meal usually has a theme. If it's no theme, then it's med. You know, but it's going to be like some sort of ethnic and because I think the challenges that we have is we got to be a different restaurant every meal in order to keep these people entertained. Like, say, if, if you go to a resort with your family, imagine eating at the same restaurant for two weeks every day, like that all three meals, like it's insanity. So I think that's where a lot of the pressure lies with 
being on a, as a yacht chef, whether it's solo or with a team, is to keep people interested to, in, 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 to not have a specialty, be able to spread it all out. Um, so I don't even know if that answers your question. It just depends, you know, like what does a preference sheet say? I think the preference sheets are getting better. I've been doing it 20 years. And the preference sheets in the beginning were shocking. You couldn't get anyone to fill them out or, or yeah. they never got them or whatever. But yeah, now they're, they're getting a lot better. I feel like they're well, much they more fill like, them out when they've had a couple of glasses of wine and they're like, yeah, free with <laughs> caviar. Yeah. Yeah. Truffles. And then they get on the boat. Problem. Like, I just want a burger. Wow. Yeah. 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 That is. Yeah. And people leave pretty casual. I feel like, like the Michelin star thing is a bit like it happens, but not that often. Usually there's kids involved or yeah. It's usually just kind of family family food but it's good fun it's chaos but I, I just like that i like that team environment too with the crew where you're just trying to like just show these people the best time you can and get through it and yeah get it there. get the level right up there make sure everyone's like yeah. hitting there. That, that's such a good feeling when you've got that as well yeah. when the chart is going in you're three four days in and it's just it's just hitting it every time like yeah we got this yeah. it's gonna be good tips i love that yeah. feeling yeah and good guests i love it when you have good guests you're like these people are awesome these people are do they're doing wealthy right i, I like them <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so if you do yeah you got 10 10 books 10 books in hand and then is there is there another project you kind of do you want to do the michael green thing in in the bahamas um no probably won't now i was going to buy land huh? there and stuff but yeah probably won't um i do i do grow a lot um i grow a lot of flowers now and a lot of herbs. I've just bought a uh, urban cultivator, so it looks like a uh, under counter refrigerator, but it has all the all the bits in it, and you just put it straight in and set the seeds wow. off, and, and it goes for it. Yeah. Um, hopefully, get delivery of that in the next few days, or in a few weeks. Sorry, um, we've just moved house. My boss has bought a house about three times the size of the one that he had, so we just moved over like three weeks ago. Uh, obviously up in New York. So we're up here at the moment for the week just to kind of work out what needs to happen, ready for the summer, because we come up here for two weeks in the summer. And um, he's just bought the house over there inside of the lake. So I've got to go over there tomorrow when he's back and suss that out and how we're going to deal with that. Um, and we've got a new property that he bought in uh, Montana for a ski lodge. So that hasn't been built yet. So that's due to, we're due to get that uh, at the end of next year. Um, so yeah, it's just dealing with all of these different things. Um, he just bought a jet as well, and I, he was keen for me to cook on the jet. Um, but going on it on Monday, it's it, there's no galley in it. There's a microwave and a, and a coffee machine, so I don't think that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's fun to be with a guy that's you know so um, uh, ready to spend his money and have some fun. Yeah, that uh, sounds like a really good, interesting. Uh just person to be involved with where it's just let's go for it let's do it let's what do you need how can we hook this up yeah that's a great great position to be in yeah and is, is, your, is your family in in new york or is your family um, no they're, they're, in, they're in florida i live about 20 minutes oh, from right. the boss's house in florida and to be honest he, he spends the majority of time there um just really the summers up here now yeah winters in uh in new york are, are not that nice yeah, it's freezing. So it's like 56 today. It was horrible yeah. on my run. It was raining and everything. I was like, oh, I want to be back in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so you switched to Fahrenheit, I see. 56. It, it, yeah, it, it doesn't make sense cook. to me now. If I, if I use the English one, like, no one knows what I mean. So. <laughs> For Celsius, yes. Yeah. I, 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 I still I, weigh yeah. everything in grams. I still weigh everything in grams, but oven temperatures, uh, yeah. It, and it's all, it's all that. And lengths. It's all American now. It just makes more sense. Right. No one else is going to understand if you say kilometers or meters. So it's kind of pointless. Mm -hmm. But it's yeah. clearly metric is a much better system. Like clearly. Yes. I'm so frustrated at my country. I'm like, come on. This is embarrassing. It, it's vastly Please. superior. It, it's in tens and hundreds. It just makes so much more sense. Yeah. Like, yeah. I don't even understand an inch in three eights. It makes no, <laughs> I don't understand no. it. But I'll, I'll measure tools. stuff out to make I'll measure it out and send it to people if that's what they want. Yeah. And, and then recipes and if you, well, I'm going to time this recipe by three. Oh shit. Or, or by 30. Oh shit. What am I going to do with all these tea, quarter teaspoons? Like what is quarter <laughs> teaspoon times 30? I mean, I know what it is, but 
it. Oh, yuck. What uh so it did it did I, help me out doing the cups when I when I started weighing things out on boats, I'd be like, Oh yeah, oh, the cups. So <laughs> that was like genius. Yeah, but yeah. I don't tell I don't tell people that. I don't tell my American friends that that the cups and teaspoons are actually quite useful on a boat where a scale doesn't work because it's rough. <laughs> it's, it's the only thing they're good for. Other than that, throw them out. Throw them out. When uh, when you were in Afghanistan, like or when you were doing one of your one of your five tours, were there do you have any like funny cooking stories like or was there ever any violence where you were uh yeah <laughs> lots of violence lots of violence yeah i mean ma mainly war-torn countries so um kosovo was uh, we're in macedonia originally uh, 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 an italian air base is where we were set up our kitchens were set up um, and we were feeding around 50 people and they were getting into convoys ready to go across the border um, and that was that was so intense. We spent two days sitting in a convoy, just everyone just kind of cooking for themselves um, out of ration packs. Um, and then we just watched all of the planes going over, all the bombs coming down, the paratroopers dropping in, wow. like the mess that this caused and the explosions and stuff. And then we started driving towards it. That was just so intense and going past um, refugee camps and just seeing the devastation that had happened. Rolling into Pristina, which is one of the capital cities in, um, in Kosovo, um, and, and setting up camp. It took us about three or four days to clean up. The, we, we took over a soap factory. It took us about three or four days to clean up the kitchens there, and we got them operational um, and started feeding uh, around 150 soldiers from that location. Um, but yeah, just I've seen some horrible films and some horrible stuff, which is quite why it's nice to be in the Bahamas working on a boat and stuff like that. Yeah, instead. but. I think you've earned that right to uh, to have the the tranquility of of that kind of workspace, but and I, I think it's the the mindset as well. You know, like nothing's impossible if you put your mind yeah. to it, get in there and do it, get the job done. Then you know, job's done and we can have a beer now. So I think that's yeah. something that's really helped me out in yachting. You you hear the I don't know, like sitting with the captain is telling you this is happening. You've got these people coming on. We're going to go to this island. And you've got people freaking out and it's like okay so how do we work this out where do i need to make sure yeah. my my provisions are and what's the logistics of that and yeah, i think all yeah. that came from our military training like just to be calm in that situation and work it out yeah i and without any military training i do love that challenge of the logistics of, of having to do that and the good cooperation with like chief officer and, and captain about your know, guests just changed plans and where we're going to do, how we're going to get a tender. We got to get it delivered when they're not going to need the tender or tenders. And it's just, I do love, I think that's, I think that's part of what chefs are is we just solve problems. Like that's kind of what our whole day is, is just putting out fires. Like, yeah. Just solving problems and, and putting yeah. food on a plate. To people smile. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I, I was time. thinking about, one of, one of those things that you uh, you asked me is like, what would you, what would be your favorite meal or stuff like that? I got to say this: my favorite thing to cook is a, is a birthday cake, because of the joy that it gives to the person that you give it to and all of their family around. When you bring that cake out, that feeling of you know like celebration of that person's life and that happiness that everyone's had when you're saying happy birthday, I just think that is quintessentially like the best thing that you can do. Yeah, that's nah, I love a good birthday cake. But I, I did, I did think this this weird like thought of uh, we had my buddy Steve. Uh, we were chartering on Magumbo for like four years together, and uh, his birthday was always was in July, so his birthday was always like mid charter trip trip. So you make him a cake, and there's only like two crew around, and he doesn't even want the cake. You know, it's like it's just like <laughs> he knows we're stressed in the galley, like long hours. There's only two people to sing him happy birthday. And it's just like, it was so funny though. It was hilarious. It was great. We talk about it every time we see each other. There was always a cake, but it was just like we even get him a little party hat. You know? <laughs> oh man, I love those times though. Those like hectic times, good memories. You know, you always remember the bad times, right? Like you always remember. No, not necessarily that was bad, but you remember the the good times are kind of easy to forget sometimes. What they say. Um... Hard times make hard men. Hard men make easy times. Easy times make software. So yeah, yeah. it's good. Luck. Hard, right? But yeah, but isn't it? It's true though. Like yeah, yeah. It's an interesting, interesting axiom where you just kind of get stuck on the on the hard stuff, and and you like it and enjoy it, and then it uh, 
yeah, just makes the best stories. Like if I tell people motorcycle stories, if I tell them, oh, it was amazing. And I went over the Andes and they're like, oh, great. If I tell them like hardship, if I tell them something was a huge pain in my ass, like that sucked. And it's a great story. If that's what they want to hear. Yeah, I think we need it as, as humans, don't we? We need to rub up against something. We need a bit of friction. We need a bit yeah. of, you know, a bit of hardship, something to push through, and we feel better for it when we've done it. I, I think it's a really important part of life. Yeah, I think uh, I think if you were gonna, if you're a chef for as long as you've been, and to do like five tours in Afghanistan, that means you re up. You know, that means like that was kind of something that you wanted to do and you needed to do at that time in your life. And I, I do respect what you did there and, and probably saw there and the challenges that would innately come in situations like that over and over again and you liking it you know like that this is this is i'm into it yeah not anymore though no too old. <laughs> yeah <laughs> we both are that's all i want to do say say that last part again i just want to drink cocktails by the pool Oh, I want drop off day every day. <laughs> drop off day. Those are man, but you can't enjoy the good without like going through the bad. You know, that's why drop off days true. are so good. It's like you suffered a little bit. Like you didn't get a lot of sleep. You uh, you lost out on maybe a little bit of life admin, and now it's drop off day, and it's cheers. Yeah, that beer tastes good, right? Yeah, it does. Yeah, you earned it as well. Like you earned yeah. it yeah nah man um dude thank you for coming on i really appreciate it and um i'm My so pleasure. stoked that you're, you're doing a podcast and the book and it was for, for me i'm always i always look forward to having someone someone on get the fork out but like i'm always blown away like how interesting people are and like to hear all your full backstory like that uh awesome man i really appreciate it and uh yeah man thanks for coming on it's always a pleasure uh, and, and nice to chat to you as well. Um, all the links will be in the comments below, right? Um, like Definitely. And share. Um, yes. Come absolutely. join me on uh, uh, Triton News. The TritonNews.com is where you can pick up the podcast. We're on Spotify as well. Just search Chef Danny Davis on Spotify. You'll find me. Uh, YouTube, Chef Danny Davis. You'll find me. Uh, and Amazon, Chef Danny Davis. You'll find me. <laughs> awesome <laughs> awesome dude all the links will be down there you guys won't have to type in danny davis we got you we got you all right everyone i hope you enjoyed that episode of get the fork out we'll see you next week see ya that was awesome great dude very interesting uh chat and inspirational dude that's seen a lot of uh a lot of gritty things in life and come out with a positive attitude the um our next guest is a uh, provisioner, a really good one, one of my favorites, Joost van Gersel with um, We Supply Yachts. And uh, we just talk about provisioning. We're going to hit on some key points that we want to talk about, but uh, it's a pretty interesting conversation, especially if you're a little green in the industry and have to try to convince people that you need and should need to use a provisioner. Um, interesting conversation. I hope you like that episode, Joost van Gersel. Get the forecast.